Mark L. Karen, welcome to Nature of Reality Radio, that conference that I met you at, the uh, Cosmic Reset, led by Pari Patri and her father, in the uh, Nature Preserve of, uh, of Madison, Virginia, the um, Seven Oaks Retreat it was, fascinating conference. It was a shame that I was sabotaged at that conference and ended up sonking out and falling asleep and snoring really loudly during some of the presentations. I hate it when that happens. It's out of my control. It's happened to me ever since 2012 at live conferences that I go to. Hopefully the implant that Daniel Teague saw in my third eye chakra that he removed after that conference was the problem, and that won't be happening, but how do I know the entities aren't going to sabotage me again? <laughs> I hope they don't, but um, I don't believe I fell a, a zonk out during your presentation. I did everything, trying to sit in the pyramids and, and all the rest of it, and nothing seemed to, to help, but there were some presentations where I did zonk out and some where I weren't, and I believe yours wasn't. I'm going to, of course, give you the chance to uh, regurgitate pretty much everything that you said in that presentation on this program. But before you do that, I want to ask you to be a primary source like I do with the majority of my guests who I let on my show, especially the guests who don't really have much of a, a household name relative to other guests, not to downplay your credentials or anything. But uh, Mark Karen, compared to many other guests, is not a name that I'm sure a lot of people would recognize. Well, hopefully that'll not change. Yet. Yeah, that'll change soon. So I want to give you the chance to uh, say what you experienced from a primary source perspective regarding spirit plant medicine. Uh, inspired conscious living uh, and all the stuff that you do regarding um, this conference and the radio that you do and everything else that you experienced in your life that causes you to do the stuff that you do. You have got the floor. I will not interrupt you um, uh, and uh, go ahead and I'll shut down anything that I hear that's important in my little notepad by me. Awesome. Right. Well, thanks for having me on your show, Andrew. I, I much appreciate the the opportunity to share more of you know who I am and what I do, and you know my mission in the world. And one thing I just you know we talked about it at the conference there in Madison, Virginia. Maybe it's just your learning style, man. You know your subconscious is open, taking it all in. It's just a, sometimes a different way to learn, right? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, my name is Mark Cron. I live here in beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia, and it's really been an interesting journey in the course of my life. I'm 52 years old, and I've done a number of different things in my life where, um, you know, I've been in retail for years, and uh, I've always been a, a fan of customer service and people. And as I journeyed through my life and entrepreneurial activities. I got introduced to some of you know, the great all-time books of Think and Grow Rich, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, As a Man Thinketh. And it just started uh, – it woke something up in me that I realized you know, the power of our human potential and how we can create and be and do anything that it is that we want. And I spent 22 years in a corporate-type environment. Uh, you know, working, loving what I was doing, and it ended up not necessarily in a pleasant way. And it left me in a position where after doing a lot of work and personal growth and development and studying, you know, why we do what we do as human beings, it, it led me on a path that really woke me up in many different ways. And on my journey, I was at a conference in Scottsdale, Arizona, Arizona, where uh, I was introduced to uh, an experience called a oneness blessing, and it was really an ancient Indian meditation over 5,000 years old used by the Indian seers. And I had an experience that completely changed my life. It was about a 40-minute meditation, and really it popped me right out of my body. I was, you know, obviously I've got to think that that's where the yogis go when they go into their samadhi. and. It, it changed my life in so many ways where I just – I understood so much and it was kind of like a Buddhist – Buddha talks about you know, reaching enlightenment and getting that universal truth and I just – I got to a point where I understood love was all we need and it was able to take everything in this place and it's really hard to describe because it's like if I – wanted to share with you how a rose smelt. It would be difficult to tell you how a rose smelt. You have to smell the rose. And in this experience, 
something changed. I saw flashes in, in my mind and my third eye. I thought I was being hypnotized or strobed or something. Uh, but as I opened my eyes, the room was still black. And what I realized, it was part of the rewiring of my brain for, for different, um, you know, synapses and neural pathways that they talk about when you take a look into the science of awakening and higher consciousness, how it opens up different parts of our brain. So I can only assume and think that that's kind of what was going on. And in that process, I'll, I'll never forget because I had my experience and when I dropped back into my seat, uh, the words out of my mouth was, Lennon and McCartney had it right. All you need is love. And it took me back to thinking about, you know, when the Beatles went through India and how their music changed and all sorts of different things. It just created a whole different perspective for me uh, on life and love and purpose. And when we take a look at life, uh, I believe our authentic state is love. We all come from love. We all want love. We all want to be loved, appreciated and understood. It's what we all look for in our relationships, in our families, in our connections and relationships. So it really changed my life in that way where I, I realized my life was really about being an inspiration to others, living a life of growth and contribution, and, and to be able to help people really um, live to their full potential. And that just started a journey for me in, in terms of personal growth, studying and learning from a number of the masters. And I continue to learn and grow to this day because I believe there's always something to learn and different ways that we can share uh, information and experiences to help people overcome trauma, overcome depression, overcome what's holding them back, even if it's just something uh, like procrastination. So it, it's certainly been an interesting journey, and it was an honor to be down there in Madison, Virginia, where I met you, uh, to be able to speak about integration and the process of taking the lessons that we learn and these experiences such as I had, so that we can actually create a joy, joy-filled, blissful, blessed life. Absolutely, and since we uh, got to listen to your to your presentation, I guess now I'll give you the chance to regurgitate everything that you said in that presentation on my show because we've got 90 minutes to to spare. So let's uh, give you the chance to uh, say anything and everything that you said in that presentation. Unfortunately, I seem to be drawing a blank from it. Maybe it was one of the presentations I zonked out at. Hey, that's that's, that's perfectly okay. Um, I'm glad you're okay with that. Some of the other people didn't seem so cool with me uh, zonking out. They don't really understand that it was. A, they didn't seem to understand that it was a problem the, that I can't really control. But well, anyhow, now I, a chance I, to. I take a look at everything in life as it is what it is. You know, if whatever happens around us, whatever happens to us, whatever happens through us, the the biggest experience that happens or the meaning we give it is our own meaning. We can all experience the same thing and give it a different meaning and we can create a completely different result, different, different emotion, anything of that nature. So for me, I just saw what it was sometimes a little entertaining with a little snore, but Hey, I'm not here to pass judgment on people. My, one of my roles, um, and the way I, I perceive things is to really seek to understand and not judge because in judging we lose rapport we lose connection and it creates separation in, in all relationships but before i go more into my talk um one of the things that really changed in my life too is after i left this corporate uh career after 22 years i was looking for what was next for me versus just a job or a career because I didn't want to just work for money. I wanted to um, serve with purpose. And it took me through some some dark times in, in a sense that I didn't know what to do. I had tons of opportunity. I could, could have done so much whatever I wanted. And uh, I met up with a friend one time at a conference and he was looking for an event planner. And I was looking for something that would complement my wide variety of skills, my passion to help people because I'm a coach, strategic intervention, NLP. I'm, I'm one of those guys who's kind of done all that kind of work, yet nothing felt right to, you know, niche out in an industry in one specific thing. And as I took over this uh, company, uh, Conscious Living Network, and, and partnered with my good friend Andrew Resmer, 
while he was looking for an event planner, it turned into something I never really imagined where um, I had the opportunity to take over, produce, and uh, run the radio show he created 12 years ago called Conscious Living Radio, where we explore you know, different paradigms in terms of consciousness, anything that creates um, you know, change, expanded consciousness, growth. We want to uh, create events that people can have experiences versus just hear people talking all the time. And that's one of the things that I enjoyed about the Cosmic Reset where we met is, you know, we had some sacred experiences in terms of just the uh, opening pipe ceremony. We had a shamanic journey. And, uh, you know, so there were some, and the meditations every day were, were fantastic, led by Pari's father. So I believe experience is certainly the best teacher. And in joining Conscious Living Network, I have the opportunity to create consciousness expanding events where we uh, we do a lot of work with plant medicines. Andrew had started a, a conference now in its ninth year called Spirit Plant Medicine Conference. And it really explores the healing potential uh, and properties of sacred medicines of the indigenous people over thousands of years, such as ayahuasca, uh, peyote, you know, the sacred mushroom or what people would know as the magic mushroom. Um, leading right into, you know, 5-MeO-DMT, combo, even LSD and MDMA, and cannabis, of course, for, for healing, and its medicinal properties as well as their, their spiritual properties. So I've been blessed to have this wide range of experiential um, transformations, not just for myself, but with others. And the one thing that I found in all the work that we've done in you know the spiritual um, world, in the personal development world, and the plant medicine world is integration. And this is the the topic that I spoke of in uh, in Madison because it's one thing to go to an event to have an experience, whether it's a two or three day personal development workshop, whether it's a spiritual retreat where you meditate and reach certain levels of enlightenment and expanded consciousness, or whether it's, you know, any kind of transformation beyond that. Like I say, you know, plant medicines to spiritual work. It's how do we then leave that experience as we go back into our regular life and integrate it so we can take those learnings and those experiences to make a better everyday life for ourselves and hopefully others. And, and that's really what integration really is about because it's one thing to go to a personal development workshop. I was just in one for the past five days. And it's one thing to just do that, take your workbook, put it on a shelf. And that's something we like to – we laugh about in, in the communities. We call that shelf help because you take your workbook, you have a great experience, you learn a bunch of stuff, and then you never go back to it. You never actually – do things to incorporate what you learned into your life or you might do one or two things yet you've got you you learn so many different tools and techniques to create change and the same goes in the spiritual world you know you can have a spiritual awakening but you know you you start going home to your to your family to your friends to your coworkers and start sharing your experiences they all think you're crazy so uh, same in the plant medicine world, you have these uh, psychedelic transformational experiences with ancient plant medicines and people get opened up in such a way that, you know, they, they get confused. They get it back into the real world or sometimes I like to refer to it as the unreal world and they're not sure what to do, how to make the best of what they learned in those days. So... You know, one of one of the most important things I like to share about integration is it's so important to find yourself a community of like-minded people. Community is key, and, and we see that in all sorts of different studies, whether it becomes addiction and whatever it might be, that people seek community. They seek to hang out with like-minded people who understand them and who can relate and, and be the same, and that's why you see groups and different cultures connected because they have the same value systems, they, the same belief systems, the same way of working, thinking, acting, behaving. So one of the most important things in, in my view 
when it comes down to integration is to find a community that you can surround yourself with, that you can have conversations, you can ask questions, you can learn and share with each other so that you don't go back into the world and not have an opportunity to speak and ask questions about your experience. It's you, you become isolated and sometimes the work that you do just gets reversed because you suppress it again. So that, that's one of the key things about integration is find yourself a community that's believes, supports, loves and cares about you so that you, it you know helps you stand up and step up and be your authentic self. Because at the end of the day, it's one thing to be who you think you are versus being who you really are. And we live in a world that we are, you know, we've got so many different masks. Every time we talk to someone, we're, it's like we're someone different. And when we become our authentic selves, it becomes a very different world. So that's one of the things I think is super important in regards to integrating and carrying on the work that you do in any kind of personal growth field and of transformation and, and 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 experience you know the next thing to to always remember and and to take into consideration and this is a tool i learned in the tony robbins world as part of his team um it, it's what i shared at at the uh at cosmic reset as well and we call it the triad and there's one simple tool that you can use to Always change how you feel because human beings, let's face it, everything we do, whether we want the fancy car, the big paycheck, the, you know, the, the fabulous spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever that is for you, it's all designed um, based on creating a feeling, how we feel. So even if it's a, a fancy car, it's about how that fancy car is going to make you feel. If it's about that job and the money or whatever it might be, the, the house – it's all about how it makes us feel. Now, how do you change the way you feel? Really, there's three simple things you can focus on. And one is your physiology, how you use your physical body, um, how you move, how you talk, what you eat, whether you exercise, meditate, do anything um, of that nature. It all depends on your, your physiology because in this bio suit, as Christina called, and I love that term, in this body, we it's, it's our biochemistry. Just eating something different can change how you feel and how you think. And it's something that changed my life when I actually became vegetarian. I, over time, uh, it, it really played a part in how I think and feel and, and process things differently. So physiology is always the foundation because your body is your temple of life. It's what tunes into all the energy around you. If it's all plugged up with, you know, bad food and, and you know, alcohol and drugs and things of that nature, you can't tune in as well as to what's around you. The, the next side of that, that triad is, is about focus. So, you know, we have so many things going around us every single day and we tend to only focus on one or two things. And wherever your focus goes, we would say your energy flows. And whatever you focus on expands. So if you have focus on what's good and what's great, you'll get more of what's good and great. If you focus on what's wrong, you'll get what's wrong. So it's same as, as you know, a great example of that is worry. Um, you know, if we focus on worrying about everything that's wrong, we're going to create a completely different feeling in our body and it's going to affect our physiology. It's going to affect our biochemistry and it's going to change the way we feel. It's going to change our state. And just by looking at something and then telling the story about it has, has so much power because the other third side of that uh, triad is what we would call language, story, and meaning. The words we use the story that we tell creates the meaning and that meaning can completely affect how we feel. Uh, I used an example when we were at Cosmic Reset. Here in Vancouver, we've got an antique roller coaster. Uh, I don't even know how old it is anymore. 
but it's it's old and it's rickety. It's safe. Nobody's ever been hurt. Some people love the roller coaster. Some people hate the roller coaster. Yet that roller coaster is the same three and a half minute experience for everybody and has been for decades. Yet based on you know what we think about it creates how we feel creates a whole different biochemistry. If you if you love it, you're going to get so much you know adrenaline and feel good excited you know biochemistry running through your 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 body and if you're scared of it that same three and a half minutes is going to give you completely the opposite it's going to give you all the stress hormones it's going to create all that anxiety your body's going to tense up in a completely different way and it's going to change the way that you feel and that's all about just the way that you think and what you're saying and doing um, in regards to that experience. So we could all sh sh share the exact same experience. So depending what we're focusing on in that experience, the language, the story, the meaning we're giving that experience will completely change how we feel. So it's important to take these three aspects into consideration because our state is the most important thing. And some people debate that we can not be in a good state and we can't be happy all the time and I happen to believe that we can certainly uh, create a state of happiness that is beyond a state of depression, despair, frustration or suffering because every single thing we do in life is a pattern. The universe is a pattern, you've got the Fibonacci sequence, it, it, there's a pattern, there's a pattern to life, our DNA is a pattern. And if you take a look at every single thing that we do, there's a pattern. Our behavior is a pattern. And it's all designed you know, to protect us from you know, feeling pain. And ideally, we want to seek pleasure. And in, in a lot of cases in our Western world specifically, we do more to avoid pain than we do to actually gain the pleasure that we want. So the other side of the coin is, is to be able to start taking these lessons we learn in our experiences and look at the patterns that run in our life, how we talk, how we think, how we move our body, the stories we tell ourselves, because these are all patterns. And when we're, if we're to live in the now and live in the moment, again, becomes a very different thing than living in the past. And as soon as you're telling stories about the past of everything that was, um, went wrong for you or everything that went right for you, there's a pattern in that behavior. You know, you can talk to somebody who had an experience 20 years ago and they talk about it today and they're living in the past and the past doesn't exist anymore. It only exists in your thoughts. It only ex exists in, in you bringing it back. And when we do bring that back, we're going to feel those feelings we felt in the past because it's a pattern. And if you keep telling that same story and you've been doing it for 20 years, it just becomes a pattern of conversation. And, and I think a great example of that is, you know, so many people have a pattern of small talk and conversation where they talk about the weather. They'll complain about the weather because it's something to do. And it's just a pattern that happens with everybody. You know, the, everybody they talk to, they talk about the weather, whether it's the store clerk or their friends or their family when they talk to them. And then they complain about it. And the interesting thing about the weather is you can't change the weather. However, you can change what you think about the weather. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, the thing that you say about can't change the weather, <clears throat> of course, there's all these uh, legends of Native Americans beating drums and dancing to try to bring the weather, um, the rain, if they need it. And uh, we were supposed to, at that conference in the Madison, Virginia, have a lot of rain, but it turned out to be very, very sunny throughout the uh, times that the conference was going on. And we... Uh, well, you say you can't change the weather. Well, can you not with uh, a lot of collective consciousness and energy flowing? Or is that kind of playing with fire in a sense? It's not a good idea to do that because you want to let Mother Nature flow its course. What's your take on, on this controversial issue? Okay. So, so in my example, I was looking to just kind of because I was actually going to talk about that possibly, and I'm glad you brought it up. I'm just talking about people's patterns of behavior because you're a pretty conscious and aware guy. You've, you've done a lot of work and setting, so you're aware of how that works. And that, have you ever read the book Autobiography of a Yogi? No, I have not read it, but it came up in okay. conversation a lot. 
one one of my favorite books by a guy by the name of uh, Paramahansa Yogananda who came to bring Kundalini Yoga to the West from India in the early 1900s. And he tells stories growing up in India where there was a, a yogi and a guru there that any time they were having festivals uh, and certain things and monsoon season was coming in and they were predicting that, you know, this week-long festival was, was going to be rained out and flooded. This yogi would just go into his meditation and his samadhi, and he would literally influence the weather. Now, that's beyond the scope of most of us in, in our modern-day thinking. Yet, you know, <laughs> interestingly enough, as a funny side note, in reading that from Autobiography of a Yogi, uh, my 22-year corporate career uh, ended up on a locked-out picket line, and we were out there for 18 months. And all I ever did was pray and thank Yogananda and the yogis for, for good weather. And in 18 months, I probably saw three days of rain. And if you know anything about Vancouver, we get a fair bit of rain. We can get some inclement weather, especially in the spring and the fall. And I was I was blessed with beautiful days and, and warm weather all the time. So, yes, I happen to believe we can change the weather. I was looking to relate to possibly the listener base who don't believe that you can. But you you can, and I, I I'm I don't know if you agree with me, but you can certainly change the way you think about it. So if it's raining outside, you know people complain that it's raining, right? Versus appreciating the rain, looking at as you were saying, you know Mother Nature's doing its thing. The world needs a drink, you know. So we change our focus on the rain versus complaining like, oh my God, it's raining today. What a miserable day! And they base their whole day because they get up and it's raining, and now they're going to have a miserable day. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that also ties into the the controversy regarding whether or not humanity is due for an upcoming ice age in the next few decades. I've heard uh, Cliff High, the Webbuck guy, say that because our planet is going to go into an orbit where the planets Saturn and Jupiter, the gas giants, um, lined up uh, together in uh, close to Earth in a way that's going to cause Earth to move farther away from the sun would uh, put us in, in a bit of an ice age. And um, there's been other reasons people have given as to why it, an ice age is supposed to happen. But I've spoken with others on the issue, and they say that those who believe an ice age is coming don't know what they're talking about. Um, the climate of a planet actually has nothing to do with its um, position in space. I mean, there is no Goldilocks zone, many of because stars aren't even powered by nuclear fusion. They're actually... Uh, electromagnetism and or scalar energy to some degree and second of all climate is said to be all about consciousness and uh, a lot of people that um, communicate with other ETs from other planets say that those planets in um, out in the universe they're all rather temperate there is a uh, there's a lack of seasons because uh, it's basically um, no hotter than 77 degrees at night no colder than 59 de uh, excuse me no warmer than 77 degrees in the daytime no colder than 59 degrees at night it's basically uh comfortable all all around and it has to do with the fact that they contain higher higher consciousness so that raises the question well shouldn't we be able to do the same to uh to avoid some sort of a crazy ice age here on planet earth if we have the ability to to do so i don't see why not well, it's certainly uh, quite quite the change from what they talk about global warming, from global warming to an ice age. It's certainly a polar opposite way of thinking. I, I personally happen to believe, and this is you know my belief, whether it's going to be an ice age or global warming or whatever it is, with the damage that mankind has been doing to the planet on such a global level, what you see in the rainforests and jungles down in uh, South America to all over the world for things like animal husbandry and oil and gold and what's happening, uh, the pollution, you know, just what's happening in the oceans. Mother Nature is taking a beating at the hands of man right now. And I'm a believer that at some point, if we don't take care of our Mother Earth and our planet, then our planet is going to take care of itself and not necessarily have as much uh, regard for our life because it needs to balance its life. That's been going on for however many millions of years that we want to debate that that's, we've been in existence. Because we've had many civilizations come through you know, this planet and the world over time that um, – 
you know, it's all starts over again. We had an ice age before, we had drought before, we had many different, um, you know, global catastrophes that have literally kind of culled the population to a degree that, you know, we've had to start over. So I think that something is going to happen. What that is, I honestly don't know. I do think we're going to see some interesting change in our world in our lifetime, you know, God willing that we uh, we actually live that long. But I think we're going to see a lot of interesting things in the next 50 years when it comes down to uh, the future of our planet and the well-being of, of, of nature. All right. And speaking of nature, I guess we'll um, move right on to the uh, um, plants and theogens that uh, that are that are prominent at the uh, conference that uh, that you had the uh, uh What's it called? The spirit. spirit it's called the Spirit Plant conference. Medicine yes, Conference. So. Yeah, we're, we're in our ninth year in Vancouver, and we kind of approach it a little different because the one thing about working with with the plant medicines, you know, the indigenous people have been using plants for, you know, as long as, you know, the information has been recorded. And we like to create a beautiful set and setting. We treat it as a ceremony, like all work with plant medicine should be. Um, you know, some people will call, I, I've talked to people who say, ayahuasca is a drug. I go, no, it's a medicine. You know, you have to really treat these things with deep, deep respect because they're very, very powerful on a physical level, on a spiritual level, on, you know, an everything level you know what uh, have you ever had the opportunity to sit with any uh, plant medicine uh, yes i have i was in peru with this past december for um you know the machu picchu area for a couple of ayahuasca ceremonies and a san pedro ceremony and i also had the opportunity to do peyote in uh the uh, win uh spring equinox of 2016 um, near the Arizona Mexico border at the Peyote Way Church. If I had to choose between uh, San Pedro and Peyote, I prefer Peyote, even though they seem to contain the same ingredients. The San Pedro was not as pleasant. Interestingly, I found myself thinking a lot about a lot of negative things while under the influence of San Pedro, but they weren't bothering me when I was thinking about them. Um, it seemed like they were trying to bring all the negative th things to the surface so they I could become accustomed to them and not bother be bothered by them anymore which is a blessing and a curse i mean i prefer not to to have that some might call that a bad trip but then again if it's a medicine then well it's supposed to do that uh, and the ayahuasca greatest feeling of coziness i've ever felt in my life loved being well wrapped up in the blanket while under the influence of that just lying there and listening to the drumming and and everything and uh it was uh, very relaxing, very, um, and it was enlightening. The thoughts were definitely there, noticing that I was definitely on something that was allowing the thoughts to flow uh, to flow more. And uh, well, that was during the um, that was during the uh, yeah during the summer solstice because it was in the southern hemisphere at that point point in the mm -hmm. world. And uh, as far as other plant medicines go, I am a smoker. But I'm very, very serious about it. The only tobacco that I smoke is mapacho, which I buy in big bundles that comes out beautiful, of the, uh, beautiful. Amazon rainforest off shamansmarket.com, which is the mother of all tobaccos and the only tobacco that, for all intents and purposes, should be called – well, not the only one, maybe, but it is medicinal. I know it has medicinal qualities, considering that it gave some mapacho to a guy who had a bad hangover at a musical conference that I was at uh, once, and his hangover symptoms – greatly went away and uh, it does provide more of a buzz than than other types of tobaccos it's the kind of tobacco that they put in ayahuasca some shamans do to to spice the brew up and i have bought amanita mm -hmm. uh, muscaria oh, the thing with amanita muscaria i i've kind of not bought that anymore because i've kind of discovered that for whatever reason my body doesn't want to um make, get high off of it for some reason maybe you can help explain this i've already got some answers to it but but like three years ago, I could take by Washington State A plus plus variety Amanita muscaria mushrooms from like shamansgarden.com and take half an ounce of that, and it would provide a very very profound delirious and pleasant experience. Not, it's not as pleasant as psilocybin mushrooms, which is one of the reasons they haven't criminalized it because many people don't like to take Amanita. But it's still I think I thought it was pretty pleasant. But the thing is, nowadays if I were to buy the same 
A++ Washington State variety of Omni Muscaria and take a full ounce of it, which according to the website arrowhead.org, um, one of the foremost authorities on uh, plant use and research um, of substances that can be called drugs, for lack of a better word, um, they, mm -hmm. uh, the experience that I got off Amanita from an ounce was not as profound as as half an ounce was like three years ago. I, I mean, I, I don't know if that was on something, but it wasn't anywhere near as profound. And when I had a chance at a conference to speak to some lady who was channeling a higher level entity of consciousness, and I asked, why is this? Are the, the mushrooms in Washington State losing potency because the soil's not as good? And the entity said, no, more than likely, you just attained a higher level state of consciousness in your sober state that you don't really need to get high off of these things as often and you're not going to be affected by them as much so is that something that i should be happy about <laughs> i don't see why not but uh i mean if that's going to happen to me you would have to think it's going to happen to a lot of other people in the on the world as the vibration of the earth rises and their vibration rises and they're wondering why can't i trip on these things like i used to back in the day do you actually see something like that happening um with many uh entheogenic um shamanic substances such as Amanita and psilocybin and all the rest of them from other people. Okay, well, there's a lot there. So first off, I want to ask you, what was the name of that website where you get your mapacho? Shamansmarket. I think it's dot com. It, you can buy big bundles of okay. mapacho for about $120. It's a humongous bundle fresh out of the Amazon rainforest in Peru. Nice. Yeah. I. Uh, so let's talk about tobacco okay. first. I quit, I quit smoking years ago, and as you know, I was smoking it up with the ladies at Cosmic Reset. And we were smoking American Spirit, which is a different tobacco because it's natural and it doesn't have the pesticides and chemicals and all of that kind of junk that's in um, that's in the regular mass-produced cigarettes today. And what happened to me was I actually got turned on to the healing power of tobacco as the grandfather plant in ceremony. And not turned on to it to smoke it, but I realized and felt and experienced its healing abilities and, and properties. And then I was, you know, I was being gifted in, in my community uh, a lot of beautiful uh, mapacho as well. So I, I gained a whole new affinity and, and respect for tobacco versus just being a cigarette. Now, we had a, a fellow uh, by the name of Flavio. He was, uh, he wasn't really an he, would, he doesn't consider him he himself a shaman, but he comes from a lineage of, you know, t tobacco, um, you know, lack of a better word. It was a shaman. He was a sweeper boy, fire boy, um, things of that in, in the jungle. But his whole lineage, they worked with tobacco and ayahuasca and things of that nature. And he said one of the biggest things when it comes down to tobacco and any of these medicines you know whether it be the amanita whatever it might be it's one thing to use them as medicines and ceremony with respect and appreciation in a different way it's a different thing when it all becomes a vice so let's talk about for a minute you know so you go have a ceremony and you go down to peru or you might do it locally somewhere where you might be fortunate to have some some shamans and medicine workers and these guys, um, you, you can have an experience that profoundly change your life and never go back to it again. And then some people will start going every single weekend or once a month or they just keep doing more and more work. And there's nothing wrong with that because for many people, there's more work to be done. And, and this is where when I first started talking about integration, where the important part of the work that we do is the integration because – if you're just going to go trip every weekend and it's a vice and you're not doing the work to integrate the lessons to create the change and you're still depressed or you're still negative about relationships and you're still not in that, you know, beautifully, you know, blissful conscious state on a regular basis, then, you know, you haven't done the work. And that's like with anything. So back to what you were talking about. You know, when you started working with different doses of Amanita and things of that nature, I can only speculate on based on things I've learned o over time. Amanita is one thing because if it's growing naturally, however it's being prepared, there's different ways that you need to dry and take care of the Amanita because there, there's toxins and things will have different effects in terms of how you feel and, and it becomes more um, 
lack of a better word, almost poisonous and, and toxic in a way because you you have to get certain toxins out of that particular mushroom uh, to ingest them fully and properly. Now, when you were talking about, um, you know, reaching a different state of consciousness that this being was talking about, I truly believe that. Uh, in my experiences, I, you know, I, I did more more work more often a number of years ago and now I'm you know unless I feel called I'm not just going to go trip on mushrooms I'm not just going to go sit with ayahuasca because my friend is going for ayahuasca there's got to be like a calling and on the other side of the coin I know people who will who, who go regularly we've got practitioners uh, locally in, in the British Columbia area who do a lot of different ceremonies and some people are just always going because it it almost becomes like a vice and if they're not doing the work to integrate that then you keep going back and I do happen to agree that once you you know because of my experience there there's a time that uh, you know the same amount of, of, say, a sacred mushroom, which is, is, you know, a magic mushroom, would have a profound effect on me, and I'd be, like, almost tripping or, you know, to a point where you – almost what you call a bad trip or an uncomfortable trip, where now I could do a heroic dose and sit quite comfortably for four or five hours in, in a beautiful state of self-awareness and continued growth versus, you know, if that's the first time you're doing it, you're going to have certain things come up that you have to work through. And this is why people have bad trips, especially on, in recreationally when people start doing LSD and mushrooms and having bad trips. These medicines are entheogens and they will show you what you don't see. They will bring your blind spots in your psychology and, and in your life to the forefront. And if people do things recreationally, it's one thing. If you're not prepared, if you're having a bad day, I'll never forget, you know, watching a Terrence McKenna video. And he says, you know, the first thing you got to do before you do any of this, um, these medicines is you need to clear yourself first. If you're having a really bad day, you got in a fight with the wife, you got fired, you got all sorts of heavy stuff in your psychology and your energy and you start going on a trip, you're going to have a bad trip. Because you're getting served up, you haven't dealt and let go of these things. And, you know, that's part of integration too. That's There's pre-ceremony integration, there's post-ceremony integration. And if anybody is interested to know more, um, I'm partnered up with a fellow by the name of Roan Kaufman. And I'm, I'm helping him promote and share his book because our community integration is the biggest, biggest buzzword right now in our community because it's what everybody needs when working with the medicines. And he's put together one of the most comprehensive workbooks called the uh, Psychedelic Medicine Integration Workbook. And it takes you through from beginning to end how to prepare yourself psych psychologically, how to prepare yourself physically, mentally emotionally before going into ceremony and as you would know Andrew you know it's important before you go sit with ayahuasca and do different things you want to clear your body and get on a diet as best as you can because you want to get certain things out of your body so that the medicines can do their work in a much better way and it creates a lot more um, you know comfort or less discomfort and I find it interesting that you're saying ayahuasca was a, a cozy, beautiful thing for you and, and San Pedro was was challenging because for so many experiences I've heard from others, it's usually the other way around. And I don't believe there's anything right or wrong about that at all. It's just where you're at and the work and the way the plants are communicating with you in you know because it's about they call it spirit plant medicine because you're dealing with the spirits of the plants that tune into the spirit of the earth that turn tunes into the spirit of of all you know all of oneness and ayahuasca is known as grandmother and she can be very hard on you and she can be very gentle you know, many people experiencing going through a, a death they think they're dying um, before they come out on the other side in this beautiful state of realization joy bliss and love um, so I think it varies on, on everybody, but I think it's important that 
everybody treats these medicines with a very, very deep, profound respect. Um, you need to be in a good mindset as you go into any kind of ceremony, and you need to be physically, you know, clean and clear to get the most out of the experience because it'll certainly make it more difficult. But back to your question, really about you know the differences, you know, plants do have you know sometimes you can get cannabis at different strains, different times that you can even take the same strain, grow it the same, and it'll it'll have a, a you know a different potency and things of that nature. So. Amanita growing wildly, wild, uh, I think, has a potential to vary uh, as well, same as a, a psilocybin mushroom or, or anything of that nature. So I think there's a natural variance, though I also believe in what you had asked and, and kind of stated, that as you start reaching different levels in your own consciousness, that, yeah, they don't have – this necessarily the same effect because your consciousness is intact right you know you've integrated you're becoming one with yourself in a different way so there's there's less lack of a better word friction in in your consciousness and psychology right well if you say uh people usually don't feel cozy while under the influence of ayahuasca well don't get me wrong the nausea was kind of unpleasant I'm talking about after the vomiting. <laughs> yeah. After the vomiting, yeah. I, then I'm like, I've never felt better. And then that's when it started yeah. feeling really cozy and relaxing. And I just wanted to snuggle in my uh, in my blanket. You know, I actually normally, when I go to sleep at night, I actually sleep naked, no pajamas. But I actually wanted to wrap myself in some clothes while under the influence of ayahuasca because that feeling of snuggle, that snuggly feeling of being cozy and all wrapped up in a in like heavy clothes or whatever, even the, in the uh, rather warm environment of Peru, it interestingly felt so relaxing while under the influence of a uh, ayahuasca. So, uh, yeah. And that's the beauty of it. It takes you through a journey and a transformational process. You know, the purge is purging you physically. It has huge physical, um, uh, benefits in terms of that, that purge and the cleansing and detoxing there. It's cleansing and, and, and clearing you energetically. It's opening us up to spirit. And for some people, that's very, very difficult and, and, and challenging, especially, you know, it, it's very common. It, it's, you know, for, for people. But I know the people who sit with it regularly, once they get to a certain point, they don't purge anymore. They don't have that discomfort. It's a very different experience. Now, I've sat with ayahuasca, I think, six, maybe seven times now. San Pedro, peyote, very different experiences. But they were certainly nothing like the uh, the initial uh, introduction as grandmother starts showing you her work. And, you know, that cozy nesting thing, I totally get it. And that's the beauty of it. That's after you've done the work. It's kind of like grandmother giving you a nice big hug, right? <laughs> Exactly. So I, I can understand exactly what you're saying. I, I've been there. And uh, now a little more controversial subject regarding uh, trying to seek spiritual enlightenment through psychoactive substances. What about the synthetic substances, not just uh, LSD, which um, it uh, comes from the fungus ergo, but you do have to tweak it in the lab to create LSD. So by that sense, it's synthetic. And then there's the disassociatives like uh, PCP, ketamine, and over-the-counter cough medicine, which contains dextromethorphan. Um, they don't produce a any light buzz by any means. They're they're very profound. And <laughs> cough medicine, they say yeah. it's a loser drug because it's what only the losers take when there's nothing left. But anybody who's done a cough medicine trip knows that it's uh, it is extremely intense. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the dextromethorphan affects five different receptor sites in the brain more so than than any um other drug for all intents and purposes and uh i mean you're, in a sense you have kind of have to overdose on it because you're taking more than just the amount the small amount that you would need for uh to suppress coughing in order to experience the disassociative effects but there's a lot of people who have uh said that they've gotten a lot of enlightenment from those disassociative substances uh john Lilly, very prominent with the ketamine thing and um doing his work with dolphins and uh, isolation tanks and all that uh, very enlightening he said he got great enlightenment from that and uh 
well, there's a whole slew of people on the internet who have written their experiences regarding over-the-counter cough medicine. There was this DXM zine that I enjoyed reading the experiences of and the information on. It seemed like uh, these people, you think they're uh, cough medicine junkies you don't know better. Well, no, there was some pretty enlightening things that they seem to have written in those uh, in those experiences to suggest that the cough medicine does have the ability to to enhance creativity but then again it's uh, synthetic and a lot of people are instantly going to shun it for that reason compared to all the other plant substances but is it really necessary to do that i mean if you truly bless a synthetic substance with with true love essence and like say please uh, source angels guys only allow me to get the highest good from this uh synthetic psychoactive substance which isn't a plant but has the ability to put me on an enlightening spiritual trip allow me to make the most of it do not allow me to get sabotaged by any negative entities or energies that might hijack my aura while i'm under the influence of this stuff and and you could be sure that it's going to be a a good experience what is your take on on using those things and is it really in our best interest to to do something like that well there, there's a lot there and the first thing i want to put out is andrew i really want to acknowledge your knowledge and the work you've done because I see that you're very well educated you have certainly done a lot of work uh, in the sense of knowing what you're talking about in, in terms of a lot of these things just the way you frame your questions and, and you know so I, I thank you and, and want to respect and honor the work you've done because I think it's really important when we have these conversations because you, you brought some stuff up that are kind of over my head in a way um, but I'm going to get to that because I do have a few things to say within that. Um, but the first thing I want to say, anytime we work with these medicines, again, it's always about set and setting, treating everything we do uh, in a sacred way for healing. For, you know, And, and I, when I say healing, I don't mean to disassociate from your pain. I mean to break through your pain and disappear it so you're free forever. Um, and when we talk about setting, we talk about a safe space being guided, having the opportunity so that you're not, you know, by yourself. And, you you know, that's why these shamans who have been doing these things for years, they can lead you through. They know what's going on. So set and setting is always the first thing we always talk about. <clears throat> and we always talk about dosage generally being, you know, low and slow for some people because you, there's some people that you just don't want to blow them out of the water. But now when we start getting into, you know, the chemical based substances like LSD, uh, MDMA are two examples I'm much more familiar with and I'm learning more about ketamine uh, as time goes on because the first time I ever heard about ken ketamine I heard about it in a recreational context and it was a horse tranquilizer and I'm like what are you talking about because I was ignorant I didn't know anything about it but when we take a look at LSD and we take a look at MDMA there is very very profound clinical work being done uh, MDMA for PTSD. I interviewed a woman on one of my shows, uh, Lori Tipton, down in New Orleans, and she's the head of the psychedelic uh, society down there. And she did a study with MAPS. If you're familiar with MAPS, they uh, are all about you know clinical research and getting all the science and data behind working with these uh, psychedelics and, and things that are entheogenic of, of nature. And MDMA has profound results for PTSD. I, I, I know people personally uh, in our community, be firefighters, service people, veterans who are who have used in, in a you know in a psychotherapeutic uh, structure using MDMA for these treatments, even from you know depression and things of that nature. Uh, LSD, the same kind of thing. It's um, we had a gentleman, he's actually speaking at our conference again this year. His name is Chris Bache, and he's a professor f somewhere down in the United States. Uh, I can't remember exactly which university. But he went on, uh, he did, what was it, 76 super high dosage LSD journeys from the perspective of a philosopher. And the level of enlightenment and the experience that he had, he, you know, I've, he's talked a couple of times uh, here in Vancouver. He's coming back again for our conference. And even after our conference, he's going to be doing a two day full on workshop um, in regards to this. However, it has huge, huge healing abilities and properties. And 
my belief is anytime you take anything, whether it be a natural plant medicine or something like MDMA and LSD, if you're taking these things for healing in a conscious way in the right set and setting, it's a medicine. When you're using these things recreationally or as a dissociative thing or, you know, becomes a really bad vice or an addiction, then it's a drug. And even if it's a drug, let's say, because I, I believe there's a time and place for everything. Uh, we had a gentleman by the name of Carl Hart come up from uh, Columbia University down in the U.S. And he did a talk called Responsible Drug Use for Adults. And he started actually by picking apart the introduction to the Constitution of the United States. Now, I'm not American, so please forgive me, but it's something to do about uh, life, liberty, freedom, um, and things of that nature. Do you, do you know that the that part of it? Um, I guess uh, somewhat familiar with it. Yeah, so basically what he's saying is just in that, when we make all these things illegal, you're taking that away. You know, you're taking away liberty, freedom, uh, pursuit of happiness, and, and things like that from people. And statistically speaking, there's more people using drugs responsibly for their own joy and, and fulfillment and whatever it might be that are responsible. There are doctors and lawyers and politicians and, you know, all walks of life, but you never hear about them because they're not the ones with the problems. And it's the small percentage, you were saying about 10% of the people is where all the bad rap comes from. So again, anything that we do used responsibly has a very, very different context. So PCP, that's angel dust. I haven't heard about that since, uh, you know, in the 80s when I was a teenager never seen it don't know anything about it myself um so I, I can't really answer to that so much uh ketamine i do know um there's a lot of work being done with ketamine right now uh in regards to assisted psychotherapy as well and they're using it for uh things like depression and and and, and such and I, I actually know some people who are are deep into that work uh, they're naturopathic doctors, but they're using it in a psych psychotherapy type situation. Um, and I know a lot. Of, I know some people also doing the same work uh, with psilocybin mushrooms, and they're using it for you know from depression, PTSD, addiction. You know, the the psilocybin mushroom is a powerful, powerful medicine for addiction. Um, and we haven't even talked about iboga. Iboga is now an African plant based medicine that they've been using in Africa for forever and they f have found that statistically speaking for opioid addiction which is a crisis uh, in our country uh, especially in our downtown east side which is internationally known for the level of addiction and it, it runs rampant I know in the US down there as well and what they have found statistically speaking is this particular plant-based medicine is more um, gets better results than anything else. So statistically speaking, uh, depending now who you listen to and where you look, uh, traditional therapy and recovery, you get about a 10% success rate. 30% a success rate for people quitting cold turkey because you got to want to quit. Uh, so I believe that personal power and that willpower, you know, is one of the most powerful things that we can use to change anything in our life. And 50 plus percent um, success rate with iboga. And it's one of those things you can sit with iboga in one session. And it's not something I've done. I do know some people who do a lot of great work in the, um, the addiction field with that. And they're taking people off fentanyl heroin, benzos, they're using the combo medicine combination with, um, with, with the iboga and it's completely changing people's life. And now these journeys are medically supervised because there's a lot going on uh, with these people and they're also uh, a, a long duration, it could be upwards of 10 days because people really, it reverts them back to childhood and it's like they grow up again and you know, they cleanse and detox and all of a sudden they grow up again 
uh, over the course of you know seven to ten days and it's really an interesting observation and if you or any of your listeners has the opportunity to see a documentary it's called dosed and it's just going around right now in private screenings but i i think it's going to be released reasonably soon um, for, for more people to be able to see. And they follow this woman around Vancouver here and her journey uh, of recovery, starting with psilocybin mushrooms into the iboga and everything else. And it was a really, really powerful movie to see how, um, you know, just the nature of addiction and, and how it works for people. And, you know, that you can actually create change. So there's a lot happening with iboga as well when, when we take a look at, it to, at at addiction. So, you know, as for the cough medicine, my friend, I honestly don't know. Last time I took cough medicine, I took a couple of tablespoons for a cold and I was whacked out. <laughs> so I, I don't know about that. It's not something that uh, is in anywhere in my field of um on my radar of, of, of knowledge. I, I just know that, you know, methamphetamine gets made out of, you know, certain, um, uh, certain products of that nature. But I, I not going to, I can't speak too much to that because I, I don't know anything about it. So it would be wrong for me to have any kind of discourse on that. Yeah. And while you're talking, I actually, uh, load up a pipe of mapacha tobacco puffing it now and some people do actually smoke it during radio shows too like andrew bartz is the akashic records reader he uh says that he often does uh smoke tobacco during shows too among other things uh help him communicate in two dimensions which he says uh the complicated and confusing stuff that he talks about which is way out there if he smokes tobacco and blows smoke like on the on the camera screen and such all the sheeple people who are listening to him would actually have an easier time understanding it. The tobacco seems to have that magical effect to help him communicate far out information. And when I heard him say that, I thought, well, maybe I might as well utilize this stuff too, because I uh, absolutely had, and also uh, clearing out negative energies and entities. Um, some people who have uh, retreats, like James Gilland with Isetti, don't want anybody using uh, psychoactive substances because. Uh, it opens up the uh, door to negative entities, but how come tobacco uh, doesn't actually do that? Tobacco seems to clear out negative things, which is kind of counterintuitive when you realize that nicotine is a poison that if you ingest it orally, it's going to kill you. So you'd uh, see. So yeah, <laughs> it's um, t tobacco is an interesting thing, and I can't I'm not even going to pretend I know you know anywhere towards the science of it i do know that it it's a very very powerful uh, medicine and they've been using it in the amazon and, and through the indigenous people for you know as long as you know records show and what i can say is in my experience where i gained uh, the respect for tobacco in a way i never have was sitting in ceremony and one was the first ayahuasca ceremony i ever sat in when the ceremony was over he basically closed us up with tobacco and I literally felt the energy when he blew it on my crown, heart, back, hands. It was like I went from being, you know, out there with, with grandmother Aya to all of a sudden just being landed and grounded. Tobacco is a very, a very, very grounding plant. Um, and that's one of the things that took me back to tobacco for a while because I was gotten so busy I just needed to ground and I found that it, it did that for me because I didn't want to be smoking cannabis and being high all the time because I had lots of work to do so I gained a whole new appreciation for that and it is a, a very energetic plant in that sense the ingesting of it yes I totally hear you that it's uh, you know but it's it's like many things many things you, you use it one way it's for healing the other way it'll kill you um, and tobacco can be one of those things and you have to be careful with it and respect it again it's the respect of the plant of the the you know the spirit of the plant the the indigenous tribes who have grown and harvested the plant and nurtured them so there's there's a lot to be said for tobacco in that sense and you know if this guy's smoking it and blowing it and communicating it I totally get it and, and I support it 100% and I, I respect and thank you for the fact to, to light up and share some of that in a, um, 
in a ceremonial context as we have the conversation around these medicines because I think it's a, a, can be a very, very powerful healer. There's no question about that. And I'll tell you, I was anti-tobacco. When I quit smoking back in 2002, I was Mr. Anti-Smoker, all of it. And now I just have a really deep respect for the nature of tobacco that I never had before. Well, also another thing I also advise, don't inhale into your lungs. Pipe smokers like me and also cigar smokers, we don't inhale into our lungs, which provides an instant nicotine rush which is the quickest way to become addicted because you're giving yourself an instant rush and it's also leaving your mm -hmm. body instantly. Well, with your smoking it through a pipe or a cigar, just not inhaling into your lungs, it goes through the mucus linings in your mouth, gradually enters your uh, system, provides a buzz that's not so intense and it leaves your body slowly, gradually not leaving you craving for another hit. So uh, mm -hmm. that's the, the proper way. And I'm sure the Native Americans who, uh, who are what. Yeah, there are not big inhalers of it, and you know it, it's it's a, a puffing thing. It gets absorbed. It's like smoking a cigar, right? You don't want to smoke a cigar like a cigarette, or else you'd be pretty ill, <laughs> you know. So yeah, I, I totally get you, and, and yeah, a deep deep respect for for mapacho and and tobacco for me on, on that level. It's just kind of what we've done to tobacco and, and the way we've you know treated it over the years it makes has given it a, a bad rap because it's again as flavio said it's one thing when it's a medicine it's another thing when it becomes a vice exactly so uh well uh what other things worthy of uh of discussing um well okay i don't uh, i mean you kind of showed this out to the whole world when you were at the conference, so I don't think you would have any problem with me bringing this up. Uh, I noticed you uh, painted your toenails blue. Yeah, I can't help but notice. I can't help but bring that up now because the color blue seems to be very yeah. prominent in my life now, considering that I just uh, had a chronic <laughs> healing and they actually told me to envision a, a blue snake um, and envision the snake of a different shade of blue, depending on how my um, vocalization is coming out because it's the color of the... Uh, of the um of the chakra of the throat chakra and um i can't help but mm -hmm. ask what exactly did you intend to do by doing that because i'm sure you're going to get a lot of stares at that like a man painting his toenails blue that seems so out of place unless you intend to get something out of the uh um benefits of the color blue um i know all about that elizabeth harper color uh, expert from the uk read all about her work on what colors you should wear and not wear when you want to do and do certain things and whatnot and uh well, I uh, can't help but ask, what was that all about? And uh... What was that all about? Okay, so here, here's the answer, my friend. Remember I started back, we talked about nothing has any meaning but the meaning we give it? Yeah. So it doesn't mean anything. Now, that being said, the, here's the meaning I give it. First, blue is my favorite color. And uh, when I started painting my toenails, and I don't do it myself, it, it started with um, with a girlfriend of mine many years ago. And we would go get pedicures together because I believe if nobody's – if you haven't had a pedicure out there, anybody listening to this right now, do yourself a favor. Go get a pedicure. It's one of the best things you can ever do because our feet are an energy center of the body. And so many people don't respect their feet and give them the, the – you know the nurturing and the care that they need to get a foot rub to you know and it all started because i had some issues with my feet drying out things were going on so i just started taking care of my feet and i'm also a pisces and pisces i learned rule the feet so there's that sort of thing that context came in as i was kind of taking care of my physical body because i was having problems with my feet um and you know we go get pedicures because i don't do it myself and you know the the young ladies who are there doing the works, you know, as my lady's getting her toenails painted, she they look at me and they would say, color, color, and they would giggle. And I would say, no, 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 you know, I'm not doing any color. And I actually started getting my toenails painted after I'd done a number of pedicures. And I thought just for fun, because my girlfriend, you know, we're, we're a little alternative in some sorts. And she was like, oh, just get it done, put a masculine color on there. And uh, so I started playing around with it. And, you know, it was fun. So what do I get out of it? I get – honestly, I get attention and, and I, I laugh all the time because here's what happens. The guys look at me and they go, oh, hey, man, what's up with that? They kind of look at me and they shake their head and like, you know, they're shocked. What's what's going on? Now, the ladies come up and they're like, oh, my God, they're beautiful. I love your toes. So for me, 
I love that. I love the attention of the ladies. And it, it, it's a conversation starter. It's all of those things. And it, it in being a conversation starter, again, I'll talk about exactly the story I just shared about getting a pedicure, taking care of your feet. They're an energy center. Because remember, I talked about that triad, taking care of your physiology. Take care of your feet. Your feet carries your carcass around your whole life. And so many people never give them the attention they deserve. So it all started that way with me. Now, the color blue, on the other hand, well, it's my favorite color. Um, and it matches my car. So, you know, I, I figure it's, it keeps I keep it pretty standard that way. Um, now, when you talk about colors, blue is also the high, a, a color of, of, of a higher consciousness of you know, spirituality. And like you say, the throat chakra, you get into your, your, your third eye and your crown, they start getting in, you know, into, you know, your indigos and, and things of that nature. So, so they're all different shades and related to blue. So blue to me is just a, a color that, that I like. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel calm. And hey, for no other reason, it matches my car. <laughs> and I like to live in flip-flops. I like to live in flip-flops as much as I possibly can. I like my feet to connect to the earth directly as much as possible because there's something about grounding, connecting to nature, your energy as an energy worker and, and things of that nature. I think it's really important to get your bare feet on as much bare earth as you possibly can, as much as you can. So that's what it is. But I'll, I'll say thanks for noticing. Yes, and uh, on a related note, and uh, maybe since you're all about conscious living, maybe you could uh, help me make sense of something that uh, I don't, I've been getting a lot of flack for even thinking about doing this, but um, there was a conference that I went to, the Empowered Light Holistic Expo back in April, and um, I decided to be barefoot at that conference, being a grounder myself, and I had been barefoot at the conference all day long Saturday, all day long Sunday, right before the last presentation, a security guard comes up to me and says, uh, sir, you don't have shoes. I got to ask you to leave. And I'm like, dude, this is flat out ridiculous for a couple of reasons. One, you wait until right before the last presentation when I've been here the whole entire conference. And second of all, this is an empowered light holistic expo, conscious life, living, metaphysics, spirituality. People go barefoot at these conferences all the time. You, This is so counterintuitive. It's it's ridiculous. And he well, told me, yeah, get out of here. I'm going to get all the security guards on you. So last thing I did before leaving was tell him you're number one with the wrong finger and then storm out and – called the lady who ran that conference the, a couple days later and asked her, okay, at what point did it seem appropriate to do this to me? Because it makes absolutely no sense. And, well, just to keep it short and sweet and to the point, she kind of, for all intents and purposes, told me, you go barefoot, you're a liability, you want to be a hippie, go to California. Kind of a discriminatory statement, especially when you realize <laughs> that uh, a lot of the no-shoes, no-service discrimination that comes in America nowadays – it really comes from the anti-hippie discrimination, viewing hippies as rugged, unkempt uh, creatures from the 60s that don't deserve uh, appreciation. And uh, I think maybe that had something to do with it. But um, the, the, the excuse that I'm a liability when I'm barefoot, you would have to think that someone in the spiritual metaphysics field would not worry about that. Because if they had any sense of the law of attraction, they would know that the law of attraction, you, your thoughts and emotions manifest. If someone who's leading a conference worries about someone going barefoot, having an, uh, a problem at the conference and getting hurt, and it being a, a liability issue, well, their thoughts are going to manifest that. It's just like a mother who worries about her kids getting the flu every winter. When the winter comes, finds your kids getting the flu every winter, and then when she stops worrying about that, when winter comes and visits her kids kept being healthy – they stopped getting the flu. And I actually took that from a speaker that was at an N5D conference that I was at in uh, Sarasota a couple years ago. So um, I did actually post a couple of messages on the um, September Empowered Light Holistic Expo Facebook page about this. And nobody's actually replied to any of my messages. Nobody's even deleted them, crazy enough. And uh, I did actually say I am so looking forward to showing up at the September conference, even though I've been banned from all future conferences there, showing up and standing on the sidewalk – with a sign that says it's okay to go barefoot at spiritual conferences and a bullhorn to make my message heard. And a lot of people I've told this to have said, dude, you're taking this the wrong way. That's not a very healthy way of uh, approaching this issue. And I think, well, okay, first of all, it's not about me. It's about all the, well, okay, maybe it is about me, but it's also about all the other people 
that have been discriminated against from this no shoes, no service, anti-hippie discrimination when they're not even hippies, like I'm not even a hippie. And um, it's also, well, it, sometimes you got to focus on not just your inner work, but also changing the world, the outer world. I mean, because infinite consciousness means the outer world is just a part of you as you are yourself. When I see these things happening at events that's discriminatory, I got to take action. I got to do something about it. But from a conscious living standpoint, are, are, do some people actually have a point when they tell me I'm going about this the wrong way, planning to actually go to the conference in September and bullhorning the hell out of it and uh, and a sign saying what they did to me is wrong and it's uh, I deserve an apology and, a, and being reinstated in the conference? Well, the ants, my answer, speaking for myself, is that I believe you can certainly take a better approach that will get you a better result because ultimately my question is what is your result do you want to get back into the conference do you want to make a point what is it you ultimately wish to prove or get out of doing such a thing you're asking me directly well yeah i want to get back to the conference and i kind of need to i feel the need the, the urge to this lady who runs the conference and all the people at the conference who uh uh, seem, they did have a problem with me doing this. I, they need a wake-up call because they're a hindrance to the spiritual waking of humanity if they believe that someone who's barefoot at a conference is a liability for the reasons I explained from a law of attraction standpoint. That's not a healthy mentality because um, that mentality is going to bring negative things. They need a wake-up call that you can't think negative things will happen or they will happen. You have to think positive. You have to think, uh, oh, this is great that someone is actually going through a good, healthy, grounding lifestyle, uh, not wearing shoes at a conference and all that. That's the way you, they have to be. And, well, <laughs> is it? I think that's the, why I'm doing this. That's well, the reason I'm doing it. sometimes there's, you know, you know, back to we, we don't know the true fact it was a liability, safety, whatever kind of concern that was, if there was other people wearing the shoes. But what I would say is if we live in the now and in this moment, right here, right now, which is only what really truly exists, the past is over, it doesn't exist anymore, then it's really irrelevant. What you choose to do in that moment as you go becomes your reality at that time. And depending on who you believe you are, what you wish to achieve, and how you wish to be seen, and the point you look to make, you need to take action that's uh, relative to that. I believe our authentic self. See, here, here's my take. If I were a coach, in, in some way, shape, or form, without you know, we've got about nine minutes left. I don't want to, you know, take you into a process that might take a little longer. But it's the, you know, you you were hurt, you were upset. Um, you felt it shouldn't happen to you, and, and now you want to make a point um, by pushing against things. And anytime we resist, it makes things more difficult. Anytime we work with the plant medicines, ayahuasca, mushrooms, peyote, San Pedro, when we resist that, it's a much more difficult journey. So my question would be, again, what is it you wish to achieve, and is there a different approach you can take from a position of love, appreciation, understanding um, to, you know, because maybe what you want is is not necessarily something that serves the greater good. You know, I like to do things that feel good, are good for you, good for others, and serves the greater good. In my filter for what you're talking about in this situation, it might feel good short term. It might you know, does it feel good for others? My hallucination is no. You know, does it serve the greater good? Mm, depending on the point. Because maybe it, there's there's rules and regulations and you just happen to get away for it, with it for two days without anybody saying it, saying anything. Now, if what you're saying, and I did hear you say that there were other people walking around barefoot, then that's discrimination. And then I would be more curious as to what's really going on within the organization, what's really happening, and, you know, how that is that, you know, when you show up, you know, that you attract that attention to yourself. Because for whatever reason, you know, you, you attract that. Um, and if you're just being a cool dude and everybody else is, is walking around barefoot, there shouldn't be any issue. And 
I, I'd be curious if that was the only reason why they they asked you to leave because other than that you could have just put your shoes on or your flip flops on and then well, gone actually, back uh, in. Nobody else was except one of the presenters was trying to did actually go present barefoot for a little bit when they were talking about the health benefits of it. Um, but the lady. Hey, I, I presented the lady, barefoot, the right? The lady <laughs> did um, say to me that there were some people at the conference who were complaining about me. Um, but the things they were complaining about was basically uh, selective discrimination, crying over spilled milk. What, what happened was the, the conference speakers made it clear that we could make the, the talks interactive with the audience. And being a radio host, I naturally am going to make it more interactive than other members of the audience. Some people misconstrued that as me being more of a nuisance than yes. So yeah. that uh, kind of exacerbated the whole thing. And she then said, uh, "We saw broken glass. We saw you were barefoot. We had to kick you out because you're a you're a liability." Well, uh, even so, with the other. Yeah, and, and see, I, I'm the kind of guy who would have picked up on that and said, "Hey, no problem. I'll go put my shoes on." Well, they flat out they kicked me out, and uh, yeah. So, so really, what's happening is there was something else there because you were in your freedom of life and human beingness and speech and all of those things. They saw you as as being disruptive to what was going on. Whether that's true or not, everything is a matter of perception. Like I said in the beginning, nothing has any meaning but the meaning we give it. So I like to give things a much more empowering meaning and, and understand. But what I do know and what I do see is sometimes in these environments, you know, it doesn't matter how awakened or enlightened or conscious we think we are, we can still be pretty mean to people, you know? And that's part of doing the work. And when we come from a position of love and understanding and appreciation and, and looking to – I'm a problem solver. I'm a solution creator. I see something and it's like, okay, that's great. What can I learn from this and how can I make it better? How can I solve this? Because I don't like conflict. I believe everybody does what they do for a reason. Um, most of the time and many times they don't know what that is. And it becomes a – you know. I, I like to be inquisitive. I like to find out. I like to dig deep and then find out what that is so we can live in more harmony. And if you're at a spiritual expo, then, you know, that's a different story. And, and without knowing their side and what they would say, you know, it it's becomes he said, she said or whatever that is. Yet it's in the past. It doesn't matter. It doesn't exist. My question is, what can you learn from it? How would you go, you know, back moving forward? If you were to just go back and, and be, you know, as they would probably say in their language, more respectful, wore shoes, and more of an observer and learner. Um, and I, I understand what you're saying because I'm an inquisitive guy too. I love asking questions. I do interviews like you do regularly. I'm on my way to our radio show pretty quick. I do Facebook Live stuff regularly. So, you know, I get it. We're inquisitive and curious guys. And just in speaking with you in these 90 minutes here, you know, you, you, you've got a lot of education, you've got a lot of knowledge, you know a lot of stuff, you're very well versed. And sometimes some people are threatened by that, especially when you start, if you're to challenge a speaker about their expertise, and they're not comfortable with it. Right. right? If you can call people out against their BS, then all of a sudden, that's perceived as disruptive. Whereas someone like you and I might perceive that as, wow, a great inquisition in terms of answering, asking the questions of many people. Because my, my belief is, and I've seen it hundreds of times in these conferences, in these things, there's no such thing as a stupid question or a dumb question. Because when you ask that one person asking a question, the odds are that there's more than one or ten other people in the audience with the same question. You're just the guy with the, the guts and the courage to step up and ask the question. And you've got that big booming radio voice that, you know, people hear you, right? And when you're not, when they can't control that, then they have to control the environment and ask you to leave. Yes, does that it, it, yeah, resonate does. at all? I mean, um, I, I always say, I'm not going to interrupt my guests. I may filibuster my guests with information, but that's part of the understanding of the nature of reality, although some guests don't 
take that very well, like Eric Von Daniken when I had him on my show. And I'm sure I don't think Eric's ever actually learned the English language in any school. Someone like me who talks very fast uh, would kind of just dis- he find that dis- disturbing. And he actually did say to me, could you please stop talking at some point during the program? Yeah. Uh, probably because maybe I was maybe losing him a little bit talking so fast and all that. So uh, and I got a, and I have gotten criticism yeah. for not letting and, guests and... speak. So it happens. And, and and some some people because as they're a guest they're there to speak, right? Um, sometimes sometimes it's really important that you do speak because you get a challenging guest who can't carry a show for ninety <laughs> minutes or two hours. It becomes very different, right? And and if you're not knowledgeable enough and skilled enough and versed enough to be able to carry that, we've had that on our radio program at times where it's like, uh oh, our guest isn't exactly as articulate as we might have hoped and we have to my co-host and i have to you know kind of fill in the blanks the key is to just be gracious about everything right yeah, right okay in the last minute we got here get out anything you like please get out your websites any uh thing else you want to point out like future events and all that uh close us out please mark well i, I want to thank you andrew for having me on your show uh, it's always a pleasure to share the work that we're doing anywhere in the world that we can. We're really proud of our Spirit Plant Medicine Conference where we're sharing cutting edge knowledge and information and experience uh, with people in regards to the psychedelic renaissance and, and using these spirit plant medicines, entheogens, and psychedelics for healing. They're a very, very powerful tool, especially I call them rocket fuel for, um, for, for awakening. And that's, uh, if you want more information, we've got great speakers like Dennis McKenna back this year, uh, Wade Davis, the Dank Duchess, we, you know, um, Chris Bache is coming back, uh, who is Chris Killam, known as the Medicine Hunter. We, we just, it's going to be three days of sheer awesomeness. And on the Saturday night, we actually have a cannabis ceremony um, that we, is led by one of our, my partners, Stephen Gray which is just a beautiful way to experience cannabis as a spiritual ally. And for more information on anything with our Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, you can go to spiritplantmedicine.com, and you can take a look at it there. There's also a membership site there. If you look at the top right-hand corner, it says membership. We actually have a, a really good membership program where you can go in and get the past eight years of uh, presentations on information in regards to these medicines. And uh, Conscious Living Network is our uh, .net ConsciousLivingNetwork.net is our website that kind of pulls a bunch of things together. It's where we list all of our different events because we've got, you know, we do we do conscious events. We've got a sound journey, a cacao ceremony on Sunday night coming up. We've got uh, a cannabis ceremony this Saturday. We've got inner dance. So we've got a lot of stuff going on. So if anyone's interested in the Vancouver area listening to this, please visit ConsciousLivingNetwork.net. And our radio show, which I'm just on my way to go to, um, is consciouslivingradio.org. It's been going for 12 years. There's over 800 uh, interviews, podcasts, and content that are absolutely free. Okay, well, not absolutely free. You have to sign up to uh, to a free membership to get access to it all. But there's over 800 um, interviews and, and conversations with people like Carolyn Mays, Deepak Chopra, Greg Braden. We've had some really great guests on the show over the over the years. And uh, tonight we're going to go speak to a very good friend of mine, Theta Phoenix, uh, energy healer, sound healer, uh, musician extraordinaire, and uh, a guy by the name of Sonny who's doing a beautiful concert at our community home on September 8th. And my website is Mark Caron, M-A-R-C-C-A-R-O-N.com. You know, I'm a coach. I, you know, I, I generally do more of, you know, all the event stuff these days, but I, I'm an integration coach i'm a personal development guy i'm just here to help people you know get to where they want to be from where they are and you know i've done a lot of work and training and things of that nature so if anything resonates with you and you want to connect with me more there's a free session available there you can sign up there and i'm happy to connect with you and, and help you uh create and design the life that that you truly desire and deserve Thank you very much, Mark. I will get this uploaded to YouTube by midnight tomorrow at the absolute latest. And um, good luck on your radio show. Maybe I'll run and do it at a future event. Best of luck to you. And, I'm, uh, I'm sure we will. And, and thank you so much, Andrew, for the opportunity to share and, and to connect. And if I can be of any service to you as well in the future, uh, by all means, reach out. You know how to get a hold of me. Will do. Namaste, my friend. Take care. Awesome.